For the past two Sundays, uh, we've really talked about some very philosophical, very theory-heavy subjects. You know, the soul's power over death. And before that, what was this? What did we do? The avatar, why God descends. So it's you know, it's just like, okay, concepts that we have to really wrap our minds around. And fortunately, today we can just be simple and we can be personal because. As we said, we're celebrating the Moksha anniversary of Swami Kriyananda. Uh, that's what we call it, his Moksha day. His Guru Paramhans Yogananda had said to him, God will come to you at the end of this life. Death itself will be your final sacrifice. And in many ways, this is a promise to all of Swami Kriyananda's children. And so we hold this promise and we can look at this day also as our own Moksha day. Um, Narayani and I were with Swami at his bedside, you know, just as he was dissolving into spirit. And that was uh, 21st April 2013, seven years ago. Swami was almost 87 years old. And uh, there are these certain moments in your life that seem like an eternity away yet. There are moments about it that just seem like it happened yesterday. I'm sure you know what I mean by that. Um, and so let's look at some aspects of Swami's life that perhaps we can use as guideposts for our own life of perfection of spirit towards that moksha that each of us are seeking knowingly or unknowingly. And we thought we'd bring about it less philosophically and more from just the little stories, some interactions that we had with him and we hope they might inspire something in you. I first met Swamiji in 2009 um, when I was 21 years old, finished college, just joined Ananda uh, to become a monk. And uh, my first two years, I, I barely had any interaction with him. Uh, maybe I met him, I don't know, three times in total, apart from some public settings, of course. And even then, you know, I met him. I was... Um, I was the maintenance guy of our ashram, of the community we were building at that time. Um, and so anytime there was a problem in his house, you know, I had to go to kind of fix it. And I was a horrible maintenance guy. I was 21 years old with no actual skill of maintenance. I didn't know how to do anything. But will you pick it up? So here you are, a really bad, unskilled maintenance guy. There's no particular reason for me and Swami to be connecting. Um, but as I said, two years me being around in the ashram, um, suddenly I get a call. Could even be a call from Narayani. She was Swami's personal assistant. So, um, And uh, I think she says, you know, Swami would like to see you. First, my first thought is, you know, something broken, something wrong. But then they say, you know, just wear good clothes. <laughs> Don't just come in your maintenance kit. And so I arrive at his house and... Uh, there are six, seven other people as well. I don't know what this is about, but Swami suddenly says to all of us who are seated, he says, you know, I'm thinking of just restructuring our work and making it a little more organized. You know, so far we've just been doing whatever we felt, but now let's try to put a, a greater flow to what we're doing. And so I have called you six, seven people to form a committee. And then he starts kind of going one by one and telling each person, what their role and responsibility is going to be. So one person is like, okay, you're going to be in charge of all the finances and, you know, I need you to think about fundraising, blah, blah, blah. You are going to be in charge of, um, you know, starting more businesses and looking at business opportunities so we can support more people who want to move into the community. You're going to do, think about healthcare and schooling and, you know, and he comes to me and, you know, just like, okay, <laughs> what's my thing going to be? And he says, and you are going to be in charge of all the spiritual elements of the community. He just says that and he moves on to the next person. So, you know, at the end, when he's told everybody what, what he expects of them, and he says, anybody have any questions? You know, nobody has any questions. They were very clear. And this was my opportunity to impress Swami, but I was already like, I had no idea what he meant. So I said, Swami, I don't know what you mean. 
by that and he says oh you know i i would like you to start organizing more classes maybe you know start t- taking my discipleship notes and you know having workshops based on that maybe you can think of ways we can attract more monks and you know just something that was so far away from what i did and in that moment the first thing that struck me was you know god sees you and the saints they see you they know you um we have this idea that you know we need to be around them we need to be showing them our skills and talents and you know everybody in that room was just as surprised as i was i know it was like this 23 year old kid you know i mean we were talking about people in the room who had 30 40 years of experience doing this as opposed to me and it wasn't so much that swami was placing some great responsibility over me it didn't last um but you know it changed the trajectory of my life from then on i naturally went towards much more teaching which i wasn't doing before but again as i'm saying what what we need to realize about the life of a saint is that they're constantly listening and tuning into each of us and they're guiding every aspect of our lives but this is how they work they'll ask you for something that you're wholly unprepared for and then they'll see how you respond not just in that moment but they'll see what you do with that uh request and that will determine whether or not they will take further active interest in your life and each of us right now need to look upon what all requests are constantly made of us and keep responding to it knowing that based on your response god through his saints through these masters will then decide how they're going to continue to direct your life and so fast forward a year later swami is telling narayani that she needs to get married to me again we've not we've still not connected it's not like he knows me outwardly i mean this is what baffles me and this is why it feels so good now for all of you who say oh yeah we never knew him well i didn't know him either and he didn't know me either <laughs> in ways that you would think it ought to be but here he is telling narayani okay i think it's time for you and shurjo to get married both of us monks and nuns i mean we already had um you know the desire inside but it wasn't like we were going to necessarily act on it but that was his direction and so boom from nowhere to now living with swami uh during that time he was working on the script of the film uh the answer maybe some of you have seen it but what you see now is not really the original script that he was working on at that time and so at that time the idea behind the script was there would be somebody who is you know who has read the autobiography of a yogi the character there would be the character he would have read the autobiography of a yogi and then would have been out searching for answers to life and in his search he would meet swami kriyananda and swami kriyananda would then kind of reveal his life to this seeker thereby would be the entire film so it would have been a lot of flashbacks you know so present conversation going back and so this is the script swami was working on so one evening during tea swami asks me shujo you know so you know i'm working on this script and i'd like to ask you would you like to play the character this this i'm writing it as a young seeker by the name of gopal would you like to play this character and at first i was like sure swami of course i'm happy to try but then he was like you know the character that i'm writing he's very devotional and so you're going to have to show a lot of devotion when you do this there's a scene where you're going to have to hug the autobiography and tears need to be streaming from your eyes and and uh, and i was like okay you know it just became harder for me because everybody who knew me then perhaps they still know me knows that devotion was perhaps one of those things that i didn't have as well as i would have liked to do and uh, there's one way a saint or a teacher could just kind of say you know you need more devotion why don't you develop more devotion but again this is not how a self realized master works and this is why we need to always be open to these realities it's not about the teachings it's not about them directing you it is them creating circumstances in your life and so swami is creating an entire movie script 
Now we shot the movie, we filmed, we spent a lot of money on it. I mean, we hired an entire crew. I mean, a lot of energy went into it and eventually none of it was used. The only purpose behind that movie, at least for me, I'm sure many other realities, hidden realities were playing out, was that I got to play the role of a devotee who was deeply devotional. And so in trying to do that, I had to become the devotee that I needed to be. See, and that's how life circumstances, the saints' vibration and consciousness, their only concern is, how can I help? How can I serve? How can I uplift? How can I be your channel? And that's the only conversation they're having with the divine. And this is something we can be doing all the time. I mean, uniting ourselves with God is not about this having an inner experience in meditation of Samadhi. It is also about taking on God's responsibilities in this world. If you are going to step into your father's shoes, you're going to take on his responsibilities for the company, for the household, whatever it's going to be. And so when we're trying to attune to God, and this is where Swami's, you can say, genius was, is that he was just open, completely pure, to allow whatever was going to come through him. I don't think he was like, hmm, let me see, I think Shurjo needs devotion, so now let me just start working on a movie script. No, his whole thing was, how can I serve you? How can I help others? How can I serve you in others? And then every inspiration that comes is guided to bring you in attunement with God. And this is another very important thing. The lives of the saints are just perfectly created for us to model our own sense of self, our own understandings. And believe me, it has nothing to do with the teachings. It has to do with the attunement of your consciousness with the divine and with the saint to the divine. And so here you are an entire movie scene being created. And this is happening for each of us. Every day a movie scene is being created for you, that you develop what you need to develop. Another very sweet moment in the middle of this filming was, there was a scene that Swami himself had written, <laughs> in which, you know, this young boy Gopal finds Swami Kriyananda giving a lecture in an auditorium in Calcutta. This is where we were filming. <clears throat> And uh, so anyway, we were going to have a lecture for Swamiji. So we decided, you know, let's just use the actual public lecture that we are doing and we'll film it both, you know, from the perspective of the movie as well. And so I was in the audience. I had my autobiography. I was clutching it. I was crying. I was listening to Swami. Um, I try, you know, those tears weren't fake, just to tell you. And uh, the idea after was that Swami would finish his talk and then he would, you know, slip out the back door and be off. And at the same time, Gopal is going supposed to run out front and try to catch Swami before he leaves. However, you know, there's a barricade. He can't get to Swami. And so the scene is that Gopal is going to shout out to Swami, Swamiji, Swamiji. And Swami is, you know, kind of, but just continues on. So it creates a little like Gopal has to work harder to find Swami Kriyananda, the beginning part of the movie. And so the idea was, I would shout Swamiji, but Swami would just continue on, get into his car and leave, you know. So a little bit of suspense in that moment. So here we are, Swami's leaving, I come running and I'm like, Swamiji. And immediately Swami's like, you know, Oh, Shurjo needs me. And he just starts coming towards me. And Narayani was, you know, with Swami. She was holding him because at that time he needed support even to walk. And, you know, she's like, Swami, you're, supposed, you're not supposed to really go there. You know, and, and we got just one, we had one take because we weren't telling anybody we were filming for a movie. So we had told Swami before, Swamiji, we can't do this again. We have one take. We can't tell anyone we are filming for a movie because we don't have the licenses that we need. And so just remember, don't come to me when I shout out to you. And what does he do? Swamiji, boom, Shurjo needs me. I mean, it's in his consciousness, it's like if somebody calls out to me, there is no way I cannot go to them. And I'm talking about now as well. If somebody calls out to Swamiji now, there is no way he won't come to you. And as we 
focus on this moment where a great soul finally merges with God, opens up this channel where we too can kind of feel what that might feel like. It also begs the question, at least for me, is what would my consciousness be like when I pass? You know, and what am I doing daily to ensure that I do merge with the infinite? And I can't wait for that day. We have to be doing it every day, every moment. And the second thing is, how can I be attuning more to Swami? Because you see, every, every spark of the divine has a very unique vibration, a very unique consciousness that they're expressing. Every saint, no matter how united they are to God, are so unique and so different and have such interesting and very individual ways they express themselves. And Swami's unique vibration was, he will help you no matter what the cost to himself. And any time you feel that you are in need of help, um, we'd very much encourage you to see if you would like to create that relationship with Swami because that relationship, we still are building on that relationship. And, uh, we can't be living in the past, oh, we knew Swami Kriyananda, we got to spend, you know, some years with him, some moments with him. Pfft. That was then. What is happening now? Are you still with him? Is he still with you? Is he still flowing through you? That's all that matters. I mean, that's over. That was karma. It's done. What are you doing with it now? And what are you doing with it now? And we'd like you to do something with it. We'd like you to start feeling what it feels like to have that consciousness as a part of you. And then Swami is a part of you. How can I serve you? And how can I help you in others? I hope you try that, especially now, constantly asking yourself, how shall I love thee, Lord my Lord God, with every breath I breathe? Many blessings. I remember the first time I met personally to Swami Kriyananda. Uh, met to Swami Kriyananda? Swami Kriyananda. <laughs> the first time I met Swami Kriyananda personally, I had this intuitive perception. I am in front of a king. I don't know where this thought came from and it was a little bit overwhelming because I had no idea why so I had to put it on a shelf and it was only years later when I heard Swamiji himself uh, talking about his previous past lifetimes being a king and being the ruler of many kingdoms and helping many people in so many different ways and I think that's the reason why so many of us, so many of you have chosen to reincarnate in this lifetime and continue to help Swamiji and become his soldiers in fighting uh, this battle for the light. But moving fast forward, uh, eventually I became Swami Kriyananda's personal assistant and I served in this capacity for the last three years and a half of his life. When I came into his orbit, it was a very unique moment of Swamiji's life and discipleship because you could see he was already transitioning from this plane to where he is right now, which is everywhere as master told him you will be free in this lifetime but you could see that swami was in that transition becoming more and more one with that consciousness of yogananda he said several times i don't know anymore where kriyananda ends and yogananda begins so you could see in Swamiji's energy, these two consciousness blending ever more and becoming one unique ray. And we had to be very careful anytime that Swamiji asked or requested 
anything from us because it wasn't Swamiji himself asking us to do something. It was Master Yogananda through Swamiji asking a specific task of us so we could help, we could grow and evolve spiritually. There are many experiences and lessons that I learned by being with Swamiji and those lessons really have shaped my spiritual life and understanding even until this day sometimes they keep popping into my mind and reminding me okay this is it, or this is how it should be done or this is the kind of consciousness you have to bring into this situation. I remember one specific story that it really changed me from within. At the end of Swamiji's life, we had to travel to many different communities to give energy to Europe, to India, to America. And in one of those travels, we had a very short uh, layover in Dubai. I remember that day I was exhausted because, you know, traveling with Swamiji was very hectic and very intense. Many things needed to be taken care of. So for me on that specific day, couldn't wait to reach to the gate an hour in advance and just be there for one hour without doing anything, relaxing a bit, perhaps reading something or being quiet next to Swami. So from going through all these security checks, finally we reached uh, the gate and I was so happy. The moment I started settling down, even before I think I put my bags down, Swamiji nudged me and he, say, he said, can you see that woman there? She's crying. Please go there and ask her what's happening. And I said, okay, Swamiji, I'll go. And I put everything down, I went to that lady and I just asked what what was happening and she was explaining between sobs and crying <gasps> that she just lost her passport it was her first time traveling by herself she didn't know anyone she didn't have a cell phone she couldn't reach anyone the police was coming and she was afraid and she was very worried Anyway, so I could see her fear and I tried to calm her down. Don't worry, everything will be fine. If you need anything, we are just there. You know, I'm sure everything will be fine. And I went back to Swamiji, very proud of my act of kindness. And I explained to him, Swamiji, she's fine. This is what has happened, but everything will be resolved very soon. So I sit again and Swamiji asked, why don't you please go there again and sit with her for a little longer? I think she needs a friend. Okay, Swamiji, I'll, I'll do that. So I went back again to her and I was trying to comfort her as much as I could and try to keep her distracted from her worries but I could see that a part of myself half of my energy wasn't with this lady it was only with Swamiji I kept looking at Swamiji and thinking why I'm leaving Swamiji by himself there what about if something happens to him if he needs to go to the bathroom or if he gets thirsty I mean he's my real responsibility not this woman so anyway anyway i i thought with these two thoughts but after a little while when i saw that this lady was a little bit more relaxed and she started to smile i just told her once more you know i'm i'm sure i'm i'm glad now this will be resolved once more we are there if you need anything don't hesitate to come to us I went back to Swamiji and again assured him that everything was fine, it will be resolved, he didn't have to worry about anything anymore. I think Swamiji saw in my energy that I wasn't getting it. And for a few seconds he remained silent and then he said, could you please go back to her and sit the whole time 
with that lady until they call us for boarding. And that moment struck me that, you know, Swamiji is trying to do more than just helping that woman. I think there is something for me here that I'm not fully understanding. So I went back again to that lady with this thought, you know, I'm going to give myself fully to her. The moment I sat, suddenly this incredible sense of joy that I have never felt before in my life truly suddenly bursted into my heart. And the more consciously I was trying to comfort her, the more this joy grew and the more consciously I gave her my love and my time and my energy, the deeper that joy uh, was. And this thought like almost an inner realization, like boom, suddenly pop in. And the thought was, this is the joy that comes from helping others. So I remained with, I stayed with her for at least 40 minutes and I saw at the end of it, it was hard for me to pull myself away from that woman. So when I heard they were calling us, I just hugged her and I was, I felt so incredible, incredible, joyful. So I went back to Swamiji and I think Swamiji saw that now I was buzzing with a different kind of energy. And, and he knew, I understood. And the only thing he said was, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that you stayed with her the whole time. Our inner happiness increases when we try also to make other people happy. That was it. He didn't say anything else. And then we just, moved in into the plane. The most fascinating thing about this story is that Swamiji saw the suffering in this woman and he really wanted, wanted to help her. He could have easily asked me to take him directly to her. And in fact, that could have been even the best thing to do. But instead, he sent me because he wanted for me to experience a specific feeling that comes from helping other people. So when Swamiji asked to us to do something, it wasn't because he couldn't do it himself or because he just wanted that thing to be done. It was because he saw that by doing that ourselves, we will grow the most spiritually. And one thing is to hear and read from Swamiji's books about joy. But another very different thing is to experience that joy within yourself. And by Swamiji sending me to that woman, he gave me a chance to taste how he feels all the time because for many of us, we need to train ourselves, we need to develop that quality and that perception about helping others. But, but, but for Swamiji, it was as natural as just breathing the air. It was just who he is in his consciousness. And that brings me actually to another story about more or less the same concept. This was just a few months before Swamiji's passing. Uh, again, it was one of these traveling moments and Swamiji was trying to recover from jet lag. So we were in Pune and we stayed in a hotel in Le Meridian, actually for two days, just for him to rest a little bit more so then he could continue with his lecturing schedule. So Swamiji has, had been suggesting me uh, to wear a yellow sapphire, but I never mm, gave too much importance to it. And these two days, in these two days, he suddenly had the intuition that he wanted 
to buy me a yellow sapphire. So one afternoon, he decided to go down to the hotel and just see the shops inside the hotel. So we went to one of those Kashmiri shops and where they sell all these kind of varieties there. And Swamiji went and asked uh, the shopkeeper if they had yellow sapphires. The shopkeeper, I mean, seeing what Swamiji was asking about these kind of stones, I mean, you could see that he jumped on Swamiji like a hungry, hungry hyena, just trying to get him, Swamiji, to buy many more things and start showing him this and that, and what about this? Of course, I have this and all this stuff. I mean, I felt so uncomfortable because I could see that this guy was going to take advantage from Swamiji. In fact, I felt like I had to protect Swamiji, and I tried like once or twice, you know, Swamiji, why don't we just go out of this shop? But Swamiji was perfectly happy, just looking, oh, this is very nice, and this is very nice. Then Swamiji started talking about he was a direct disciple of Ramahansa Yogananda and the founder of Ananda, where people live together in harmony. And the shopkeeper, just seeing how spiritual Swamiji was, he tried to use the spiritual approach by saying, you know, this is something that will help the energy of your house and these other stones will help to develop these spiritual qualities within yourself. I mean, it was really bad and I, I saw myself like getting so mad and so angry at this guy, but Swamiji was completely oblivious to this guy's greed energy. And he, instead, Swamiji was like, so praising him so much and showing so much love, but you know, you are so helpful showing me all these things. I didn't think about it, but yes, I like this, I like that. I know this wasn't the shiniest hour of my spiritual life, but I was really upset with this guy. I just kept looking at him with so much anger. <laughs> and at some point, Swamiji has all these yellow sapphires. And he looks at me and says, you know, this is a very nice yellow sapphire. I think you should, we should take this. <laughs> and I remember telling him, Swamiji, I dislike very much this yellow sapphire. I don't think, I don't need any of them. But Swamiji made up his mind and he wanted to buy that yellow sapphire. By then, I realized Swamiji was doing much more than just shopping. And when I understood that, I told to myself, Narayani, relax, step away, you know, detach yourself from this situation, allow Swamiji to do what he needs to do and just go away for a while. So I went to the other side of the shop just to cool myself down because I was really heated from within. And after a few moments, I came back and I saw on the counter so many other things that Swamiji was going to buy because these men were just convincing him to buy all these items. So now Swamiji not only had the yellow sapphire, but he had also an aquamarine bracelet. He had this uh, red shawl pashmina and a few other things. So I go there, I look at Swamiji and Swamiji, don't worry, these are just gifts for my friends. I say, fine, Swamiji, whatever you want. We go to the other counter to pay. And when this, the shopkeeper tells, Swam, tells Swamiji the amount of money, he tells Swamiji, could you please make sure to pay by cash? And I was like, here he comes again. I mean, how greedy can he get? And then Swamiji says, sure. So he looks at his wallet and he saw there wasn't enough money to pay by cash. So he asked, can I pay also by credit card? Sure, there is no problem. So by the time the receipt came, Swamiji took out from his pocket this beautiful Swarovski pen that he just bought, I think, a week before. And the shopkeeper exclaims, wow, that's such a beautiful pen. And Swamiji said, 
oh, you like it? Take it. And the shopkeeper, oh, thank you. And he puts it puts him in in his pocket and I was like no way this is too much to handle I can't believe I mean how greedy this guy is and Swami is just so happy thank you so much you have been so helpful I hope to see you once more again thank you so much I'm so happy with my gifts and then we left the shop it took me a while I mean hours to shake off the kind of energy that I brought myself in with the whole situation. But it was only at night when I was meditating about this episode and I thought I had missed several things in the situation. And I don't know what he was trying to teach to the shopkeeper, but certainly there was a big lesson for me. Perhaps for the shopkeeper, he was a man who had to fight for every little penny that he earned and most probably not in the most dharmic means. But Swamiji, instead of resisting that man's greedy, that man's greedy energy by just pushing that away or to just, you know, scolding him or being like nasty, he cooperated with that and showered him with love and praise because I think Swamiji wanted to give that man the experience of what it means to receive without fighting for it or deceit, something that perhaps this man have had to do throughout his life. So what Swamiji gave to this man in those 20 minutes perhaps is something that no one, no one ever had given to him. But for me personally, I came to realize that you cannot overcome people's negative energy by injecting more negativity of your own. In fact, when people are being negative, that's when you need to show more love and compassion. And that's something that I try to remind myself a lot, especially working with people. But a few months later of this episode, my birthday came and we were having dinner and Swamiji went for a moment to his bedroom and he came back with a bag of gifts. And then he said, happy birthday, I hope you like these gifts. So when I opened the bag, I could see there were three gifts there. One was the yellow sapphire, the other thing was this bracelet, the aquamarine bracelet, and the other was <laughs> the red, Pashmina shawl and what Swamiji was trying to tell me then was that you know whatever God sends you in form of people being negative just take it and embrace it as God's gift and wear it with dignity and try to improve the situation by adding more love and compassion of your own and that was a really wonderful memory that I try to remember constantly and I'm going to end here with what Shujo was saying about Swamiji trying to always break through any limitation that we had we had created in our minds I remember one morning I was trimming Swamiji's beard and I was thinking on my own thoughts and he took my wrist like this and asked me, are you going to write a book about myself? And I said, well, so I mean, the machine was still buzzing. And I replied, well, Swamiji, I don't know, I never thought about it. And obviously you can see my English is not that good. So I don't know if I'll be able to do it. Swamiji, as if he didn't 
hear what I was saying, he asked, is it going to be a biography or a reminiscences? The way in which Swamiji looked at me, the, the, the eyes in which he asked that, I could see he was uh, doing something more than a simple request. And I reply, well, Swamiji, in that case, if I need to write anything about you, I think it will be reminiscences and perhaps my personal stories with you because I will feel more comfortable, but you know my English. And he said, don't worry about that. I'll help you. And suddenly this wave of peace descended over me like, okay, as long as he will help me, I'll, I'll be able to do this. Three weeks later, Swamiji passed away. He never spoke about, again about this request. He never told me how he would help me, when he will help me, through whom, nothing. He allowed myself to fill it out how to go about it and to develop the intuition and the strength how to work and to manifest that book. I thought it would have taken me years to write such a book, but two or three years after his passing, I felt that inner call of Swamiji saying, I think you are ready, let's give it a try. I will help you don't worry, I'll be there. Suddenly, I, when I started working on that book, I, I, all the stories kept coming up and stories that I never thought I could remember. And I could feel that Swamiji was there helping me, attuning myself and giving me even the right words, the right concepts. And then I thought, here he is. He has never left us and he's always by your oversight. And this is really what Swamiji is. He's not just a memory. He's a living presence. And the more we attune ourselves to him, to master through him, the more he will be able to help us. I wanted to say that this is the book <laughs> that eventually was uh, created and is called My Heart Remembers, Swami Kriyananda. This is a book with so many stories about my time with him and how it really looked like at the end of a life of discipleship for Swami Kriyananda. What was the kind of consciousness he had? So. If by any chance you are interested in know more about um, his life and how he helped all of us, uh, please let us know and we'll be happy to send you a copy or a PDF of the book. Thank you very much for being part of this satsang. It's very special for us to speak about Swamiji and remember him and he's in our hearts. And let's please finish with the fire ceremony. I don't think let's not do it. It's already 11. Let's just okay. end healing prayers. Okay. Normally we do the fire ceremony, but I think we've just arrived at such a nice, sweet moment. Especially trying to feel the consciousness of a saint, of a disciple, of a great master. And each of us wanting to express that same freedom, that same consciousness, that same love. So let's take a moment just to visualize ourselves already manifesting that consciousness. What would it be like? Having united with God, we must then act as His instrument that is what it means to become one with God. It's not just for us. And one of the most important responsibilities and the one thing God cares most about are His children. 
every soul everywhere. And so let us take on that responsibility now. That from this moment forth, as consciously as we can, we will try to be that channel, that instrument, that God may work through us for the upliftment of all. And visualizing all souls everywhere and all life forms. Let's rub our hands together asking to be guided, to be blessed and to be used that we may become united with God's ever-increasing, ever-present love. Ooh. Ooh.